Welcome back, viewers, to the Stellar Twin Voyagers program. Today, I, Nova A239, will once again guide you through another adventure of the siblings as they strive to explore their colorful dreams. Let's journey together through eternal ages and fulfill dreams amidst the ocean of stars. Get ready to be enchanted by the wonders of the universe and stories full of hope that will inspire us all. Our sweet shepherd boys begin their journey anew as the morning sun heralds a fresh start. After waking up and tidying their beds, they dash towards the kitchen to greet their parents and grandpa. Good morning, dad. Good morning, mom. Good morning, grandpa, they say in unison. Good morning, my children, father and mother reply. We're off to shepherd the sheep first, dad, mom. Are you going to the market again today? Asks Aster. Father nods, yes, I'll go to the market again to sell the remaining corn. Hopefully, everything sells out today. I might return a bit later in the afternoon, I also plan to buy some necessities in town, so you have lunch with grandpa and mom first, father says, you've been good children. Help grandpa like yesterday, don't trouble him in the field. Okay, dad, said Aster and Cosmo. We'll fetch water first, we'll be right back. They quickly run back down the hill to fetch water, then return. Mom, here's the water we fetched, we will go to pasture now, says Aster as he places the bucket next to the kitchen, as does Cosmo. Good, thank you, hurry up and take a bath after it, get ready for breakfast, says mom. Okay, mom, their two sons say before running out of the house towards their sheep pen. However, from a distance, they noticed something amiss. Their sheep pen was damaged again, and several sheep had escaped. Cosmo, chase after those sheep, I'll go get dad and grandpa right away. Oh no, dad was about to leave for town, and now this happens, said Aster. Cosmo nodded in understanding while Aster hurried to fetch dad and grandpa. Oh no, not again, said dad, scratching his head as he ran towards the damaged pen. Aster began counting their sheep. This is bad, dad, grandpa, we have six adult sheep and two lambs missing, said Aster, panicking. Yes, that's a problem too, but right now dad and grandpa need to fix the pen first to prevent any more sheep from escaping, said dad, taking out his tools. Aster walked around the pen and suddenly remembered. The sheepdog guarding the pen was also missing. Aster, worried, tried calling his faithful sheepdog, but there was no response. Seeing the worry in father and grandfather's faces, Aster quickly took action, Father, grandfather, I will go into the forest to search for our missing sheep and shepherd dog first. I'll be back soon. Grandfather smiled and said, my proud eldest grandson, all right, be careful. If you encounter any wild animals, come back immediately for help. Ah, and here, take this torch. You might need it later. All right, grandpa, thank you, grandpa, father, grandfather, I'm off said Aster, waving his hand as he ran toward the forest. There were some clear tracks of the animals. It was obvious that there was a group of V-shaped footprints overlapping each other, and there were also larger tracks with four distinct toes. There were other tracks as well, like dog prints. The grass around was trampled, and there were some sheep wool tufts on small branches. There was no doubt this was the path the fleeing flock had taken. Suddenly, Aster heard bleeding behind him. Ba, ba, a lamb was chasing him while bleeding continuously. Brother, brother, this lamb keeps escaping from the pen, it might be trying to show us something, maybe trying to lead us to the flock, said Cosmo, catching up while panting. Cosmo, what about? Father and grandfather, what about our other sheep? Aster asked, surprised and a bit worried. Don't worry, brother. Grandfather and father said they could handle it. Grandfather asked me to find you and help you, plus this lamb kept struggling in the pen, said Cosmo, bending over and holding his knees from exhaustion. All right, you take it easy, Cosmo. I'll follow the lamb's lead. I already suspected it, seeing a lot of trampled grass around here, and there are some sheep wool tufts caught around here. This must be the way they went. Besides, can you smell it? Aster asked his younger brother. Smell what, brother? Cosmo asked curiously, sniffing around. This is the smell of our dog's urine. He must have left some clues to help us track where they went, Aster explained. Wow, amazing. You can figure out so much just from small clues like that, Cosmo said in awe. Yes, you should be like that too, Cosmo. As shepherds, we must be keen on small things and act quickly. Come on, let's not waste time here, let's find them and go home, Aster said. They immediately followed the tracks left by the flock, paying attention to the hints given by the little lamb guiding them, and eventually, they found the flock resting near a large tree, some of them slightly injured and many exhausted. Their shepherd dog seemed badly injured by bites or scratches from coyotes obtained while defending the flock. Slowly, Aster knelt down, tore his sleeve to wrap the wounds of their dog. You'll be alright, we'll take care of your wounds. Thank you for fighting hard to protect our flock, Aster said tenderly, hugging their dog. The dog looked at him with tears in its eyes. Cosmo, count the flock again here, see if they're all accounted for. If they are, let's wake them up and guide them back, Aster instructed. Cosmo nodded and quickly counted, all accounted for, brother. Let's go, little sheep, it's morning, time to wake up and line up. Cosmo shook the little bell on his shepherd's staff to wake the sheep. One by one, they woke up and started lining up. Good, Cosmo, well done. Now, you led from the front. I'll watch from the back to make sure none of the flock stray while carrying our poor shepherd dog. Cosmo nodded and began walking in front. Aster followed, and slowly, they made their way out of the forest. At the entrance of the forest, father was anxiously waiting for his two sons. Father, weren't you working with grandfather to repair the pen? Asked Cosmo and Aster in surprise. Hee hee, we finished that already, let me help you. Give me the dog, Aster. I'll treat his wounds immediately. Good job, my precious sons, said father proudly. Aster quickly handed the dog over to father. Okay, now you two get the sheep back into the pen and come home. After breakfast, you can take the flock to the meadow, father instructed. Yes, father, the two little shepherds replied in unison. They quickly guided their sheep into the pen, securely locked it, and ran back home. There, mother was waiting with breakfast, worry etched on her face. Ah, my sons, are you tired? Come and eat, but first, wash your faces, hands, and feet in the backyard, said mother with care. The two shepherd boys quickly cleaned themselves up and returned to the table, waiting for their father. 
Soon after, their father came home, I'm back, let's have breakfast together. He said, heading to the backyard to wash his hands. Once everyone was seated at the table, mother served the sandwiches she had made, a bowl of soup, fried eggs and ham, and milk to the whole family. Let's eat. Aster, Cosmo, drink your milk first. I'll pour more for you. You're still growing and need proper nutrition, mother said gently. Okay, mom. Thank you, mom. This soup smells wonderful, thank you. For breakfast, the two shepherd boys said in unison as they began eating their breakfast. Oh, my dear wife, I forgot to give this to you. Here's the shopping money for this month. This is from yesterday's sales. And, dad, this is money for you so you can buy what you need. And, Aster, Cosmo, this is pocket money for both of you. Use it wisely, father says, handing over the money from yesterday's sales. Wow, this is a lot, dad. We don't need it yet, says Aster politely declining. It's okay, just save it in your piggy banks. You'll surely need something later, so you can use your savings then, father says. Okay, dad, we'll keep it safe. Thank you very much, dad, says Aster as the two shepherd boys take their money. All right, now that breakfast is all served. Let's eat together, says mom. Yay, exclaim the two boys happily. The family spends time enjoying their breakfast happily. After finishing their breakfast, father quickly prepares to load sacks of corn onto the ox cart, then bids farewell to grandpa, his wife, and their two sons, and leaves early in the morning. We'll also take the sheep to graze now, mom, said Aster. All right, be careful, said mom. The two boys then headed to the sheep pen that grandpa and dad had just repaired, carefully opened the gate, and led their sheep to graze and drink water at the river. Afterward, they prepared to head back home. Let's count again to make sure none are missing. 1, 2, 3, 9, 11, 22, perfect, our flock is all here. All right, let's open the pen and let them back, Aster said. Cosmo nodded and helped open the pen door. Enjoy yourselves back in the pen, dear mister. Miss Sheep, and please take care of yourselves, don't trouble mister. Guard dog too much, he needs to rest because he got injured protecting you, said Aster, then close the gate. After that, they ran back home. Aster, Cosmo, have you herded your sheep? Mom asks shortly after father leaves. Yes, mom, Aster replies. Can you help mom gather eggs from the chicken coop? I'm a bit busy here, mom asks. Okay, mom, we'll gather them and be right back, says Aster and Cosmo. All right, thank you, my smart children. The basket is already on the table, says mom happily seeing her two very mature sons. Aster and Cosmo quickly run to the chicken coop, carefully collect the chicken eggs, refill their feed and water, then close the co-op door and quickly return. Here, mom, we collected the chicken eggs, says Cosmo ahead of his older brother. Ah, that's great, thank you again, obedient children of mine. Just place them on the dining table, I'll move them to another place later, says mom. Aster doesn't see their grandpa, then asks, mom, has grandpa already gone to the field? Yes, grandpa has already left to tend to the field. If you don't have any other tasks, you can look around the field and ask if grandpa needs any help, mom says. All right, mom, in that case, we'll go to the field first, says Aster, and they both quickly run to meet their grandpa in the field. There, they see that grandpa is already working, preparing their land to plant winter wheat, continuing the work left from yesterday. Grandpa, we're here to help, shouts Aster waving his hands. Grandpa stops briefly, wiping sweat from his forehead, then says, all right, let's join grandpa here. Bring the small digging fork that grandpa placed near the hut. Okay, grandpa, they both say and quickly fetch their respective tools. Let's continue to aerate the soil here to prepare for planting winter wheat. We just need to loosen the topsoil with this digging fork to improve air circulation and allow water to penetrate better into the deeper layers of the soil later, so the seeds can grow well. All right, let's start working. Both of you work. Together to aerate the soil in that plot over there, says grandpa. Okay, grandpa, says Aster and Cosmo, then they head to the field plot assigned to them. They start loosening the soil, but some parts of the soil are a bit harder. Aster doesn't lose heart and continues to hoe and aerate it until the soil is no longer clumped. Brother, I'm tired. This task is really tiring. The soil is very compact, and my shoulders are sore, complains Cosmo. Come on, Cosmo, we shouldn't keep complaining. We're boys, so we should indeed be doing tasks like this. It also trains us to become stronger and more patient. If you're tired, you can take a short break, and I'll continue hoeing and aerating the soil, says Aster. Grandpa smiles hearing Aster's mature words. Feeling ashamed of his persistent older brother, Cosmo replies, All right, if you're not going to rest, I won't either. I also want to be strong like you, brother. I'll continue hoeing. Aster smiles hearing his younger brother's response and continues to finish his task. Before they know it, they've been working on their field for quite a while, and the sun is high in the sky. Grandpa then stops briefly and says, Aster, Cosmo, come here. Aster and Cosmo run towards their grandpa, and grandpa wipes the sweat from their foreheads, Wow, you've both really worked hard today. Now let's take a short break. Aster, Cosmo, go home and get your lunch from mom. We'll have lunch shortly before continuing our work. All right, grandpa, says Aster and Cosmo, then they run home and quickly return with their lunch packed by their mom. They quickly rested in the hut and enjoyed their lunch. After finishing their meal, grandpa took a short break, fanning himself with his hat. Seeing his grandson sitting quietly in front of him, grandpa smiled and then opened his eyes, taking a sip of water. All right, grandpa said, what shall we discuss today? Ah, grandpa didn't finish discussing the solar system yesterday. Would you like to hear grandpa explain about the outer planets today? Yes, grandpa, yes. Aster and Cosmo exclaimed together. Grandpa's grandsons are indeed very enthusiastic. Very well, grandpa will begin telling the story again today. But before continuing with the explanation of the outer planets, grandpa remembered something. Do you already know what the geocentric and heliocentric models are? Grandpa asked. Both grandsons shook their heads. Grandpa smiled and began to explain, all right, if you don't know yet, then grandpa will explain it. Since ancient times, humans have looked up at the sky and wondered about their place in the universe. Various ancient civilizations developed theories to explain the movements of celestial bodies. 
One of the earliest and most influential theories was the geocentric theory, which was later replaced by the heliocentric theory after a long journey filled with observations, debates, and scientific innovations. The earliest theory to develop was the geocentric theory. The geocentric theory itself is rooted in the view that Earth is the center of the universe, and all celestial bodies revolve around it. This concept made sense in ancient times because from the observer's perspective on Earth, it appeared that the Sun, Moon, and stars moved across the sky in a consistent daily pattern. The geocentric theory was codified in detail by Claudius Ptolemy, Ptolemy in his work, Almagest, in the 2nd century AD. In Ptolemy's model, Earth was at the center of the universe, surrounded by eight crystal spheres carrying the planets and fixed stars. Ptolemy introduced the concept of epicycles, small circles within larger circles, to explain the retrograde motion of planets, when planets appear to move backward in the sky. This geocentric theory was also supported by the philosophy of Aristotle and the teachings of the Christian Church. Aristotle argued that Earth was the center of the universe because it was the heaviest element and therefore naturally situated at the center. The Christian Church accepted this view because it was considered consistent with Scripture, where humans were created as the focus of God's attention, and Earth as the dwelling place of humans had to be at the center of the universe. However, over time, more careful astronomical observations began to reveal weaknesses in the geocentric model. The retrograde motion of planets explained by epicycles became increasingly complex and unsatisfactory for some astronomers. Therefore, in the 16th century, Nicolaus Copernicus proposed the heliocentric theory in his work, De Revolution I Bus Orbium Colistium. According to this model, the Sun was at the center of the universe, and Earth, along with other planets, orbited around the Sun. Copernicus introduced the idea that Earth's daily rotation caused the daily motion of celestial bodies, and Earth's annual orbit caused seasonal changes in the retrograde motion of planets. Copernicus's heliocentric theory was initially not widely accepted. Besides conflicting with established philosophical and religious beliefs, the empirical evidence supporting heliocentrism was still not convincing to many scientists at the time. Enter Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei, with his telescope, provided strong evidence for the heliocentric model. He observed the phases of Venus and the moons of Jupiter, which could not be explained by the geocentric model. His work provided significant momentum for the acceptance of heliocentrism, although he faced strong opposition from the Catholic Church. Then, Johannes Kepler perfected the heliocentric model by discovering the laws of planetary motion, which show that planets move in elliptical orbits with the Sun at one focus. These laws provided highly accurate predictions of planetary positions and strengthened the heliocentric model. The renowned physicist Isaac Newton completed the heliocentric revolution with his theory of gravity. In his work, Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, Newton demonstrated that the gravitational force between the Sun and planets resulted in elliptical orbits as discovered by Kepler. This provided a strong physical explanation for why planets orbit the Sun rather than Earth. The transition from the geocentric to the heliocentric theory was one of the greatest revolutions in the history of science. This change was not just about replacing one model with another but also represented the development of scientific methods, from observation, critical analysis, to the formation of theories supported by empirical evidence. The heliocentric theory paved the way for modern understanding of the cosmos and demonstrated how scientific knowledge continues to evolve through testing and updating. So, you understand that science is dynamic, my grandchildren, and science is not something static, but always adjusts and updates itself based on evidence and new discoveries. Yes, we should also thank the scientists of the past, because through their efforts, we now know quite a lot about this universe, Grandpa said. Both grandsons nodded in agreement. Then, Grandpa continued, all right, now Grandpa will explain about the Jovian planets. The outer planets are Jovian planets in the solar system are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They are known as gas giants due to their large size and compositions mostly consisting of gas and ice. First, let's start with Jupiter. Jupiter has stripes of red, brown, yellow, and white. These colors come from thick clouds of ammonia, ammonium hydrosulfide, and water ice in its atmosphere. Its diameter is about 11.2 times that of Earth, and its mass is approximately 318 times Earth's mass. Its density is about 0.24 times that of Earth, which means if we could place Jupiter in water, it would float despite its massive size. Jupiter's core consists of heavy elements, likely rocks and ice, surrounded by a layer of metallic hydrogen. Its atmosphere is primarily composed of hydrogen 89.8% and helium 10.2% with traces of methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and water. The temperature on Jupiter's upper clouds is around minus 145 degrees Celsius, while it can reach thousands of degrees Celsius near the core. Jupiter rotates very quickly, about 9.9 .9 hours, causing it to have a slightly flattened shape at the poles. Its orbit around the Sun takes 11.86 Earth years. Interestingly, Jupiter has the Great Red Spot, a large persistent storm that has been active for at least 400 years, with a diameter about 1.3 times that of Earth. Jupiter also has a thin ring system consisting of small dust particles mostly originating from collisions between meteoroids and Jupiter's moons. Jupiter itself is known to have 79 natural satellites. Some famous moons include Io, known for its high volcanic activity, Europa, with an icy crust and a subsurface ocean, considered a potential candidate for microbial life, Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, larger than Mercury, with its own magnetic field, and Callisto, an ancient moon covered in thick ice and numerous craters. Second, Saturn. This planet has a pale yellow color with subtle bands. This color comes from crystalline ammonia clouds in its atmosphere. Its diameter is about 9.45 times that of Earth, and its mass is around 95 times Earth's mass. Its density is about 0.12 times that of Earth, the lowest density among planets, lighter than water. Its core composition likely consists of rocks and ice, surrounded by layers of metallic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen. Its atmosphere is mainly composed of hydrogen 96.3% and helium 3.25% with traces of methane, ammonia, and ethane. The temperature on Saturn's upper clouds is around minus 178 degrees Celsius, while it increases near the core. Saturn rotates rapidly as well, about 10.7 hours, with an orbital period of about 29.46 Earth years. 
Saturn is famous for its extensive ring system consisting of ice and dust particles. These rings are divided into seven main sections named alphabetically and composed of thousands of smaller rings. There is also a mysterious hexagonal shape in the atmosphere around Saturn's North Pole. Saturn has 146 known natural satellites. Some well-known moons include Titan, the largest moon of Saturn and the only moon with a thick atmosphere containing methane and nitrogen, Enceladus, an icy moon showing active geysers, indicating a possible subsurface ocean, Mimas, known for its large Herschel crater, resembling the Death Star. Grandpa chuckled, that was quite lengthy. Grandpa needs a drink. Grandpa took a short break to drink water and continued, the third planet is Uranus, known for its blue-green color caused by methane in its atmosphere that absorbs red light and reflects blue light. Its diameter is about 4 times that of Earth, its mass is about 14.5 times Earth's mass, and its density is about 0.23 times Earth's density. Its core composition consists of rocks and ice, with a mantle of water, ammonia, and thick methane. Its atmosphere is mainly composed of hydrogen 82.5%, helium 15.2%, with methane 2.3%, providing its distinctive color. The temperature on Uranus's upper clouds is about minus 224 degrees Celsius, making it the coldest planet in the solar system. However, its temperature increases in the mantle and core. Uranus rotates about its axis every 17.2 hours, but it has an extreme axial tilt 98 degrees causing it to rotate, rolling, along its orbit. Its orbital period around the Sun is 84 Earth years. As Grandpa mentioned earlier, Uranus has an extreme axial tilt that causes it to roll along its orbit, resulting in extremely pronounced seasons. Uranus also has 13 thin, dark rings and 27 known natural satellites. Some famous moons include Titania, the largest moon of Uranus with a surface of ice and rock, Oberon, the second largest moon with many craters and a rocky surface, Miranda, known for its highly varied surface with tall cliffs and large valleys. Lastly, Neptune. This planet's color is blue, also due to methane in its atmosphere that absorbs red light and reflects blue light. Its diameter is about 3.88 times that of Earth. Its mass is about 17 times Earth's mass, and its density is about 0.30 times Earth's density. Neptune's core composition consists of rocks and ice, with a mantle of water, ammonia, and thick methane. Its atmosphere is mainly composed of hydrogen 80%, helium 19%, and methane 1.5%. The temperature on Neptune's upper clouds is about minus 214 degrees Celsius, and it increases near the core. Neptune rotates on its axis every 16.1 hours, with an orbital period around the Sun of 164.8 Earth years. A unique fact about Neptune is its fastest winds in the solar system, reaching speeds up to 2,100 km per hour. Neptune also has five main thin rings composed of dust particles and 14 known natural satellites. Some famous moons include Triton, the largest moon of Neptune with a retrograde orbit opposite to the planet's rotation, and active geological activity including active nitrogen geysers, Proteus, the second largest moon with a rocky surface and many craters, and Nereid, known for its highly eccentric orbit. So, that concludes our story about the outer planets for today. Isn't it fascinating to learn so many interesting facts about the planets in the solar system? Absolutely, Grandpa, very fascinating indeed. Tell us more, Grandpa, said Cosmo. Ha ha ha, of course, but maybe next time, Grandpa is a bit tired now. Grandpa will go back to work, said Grandpa. All right Grandpa, we'll go back to the fields to help Grandpa, said Aster and Cosmo, packing up their lunch boxes and quickly running to meet their Grandpa, who had already returned to work in the fields. And that wraps up today's episode of the Stellar Twin Voyagers. Wasn't it enjoyable? Would you like to explore the awe-inspiring outer space with us? Stay with us on this program, and we'll meet again in the next episode. In short, I'm Nova A239, very happy to share stories with